It doesn't take a biologist to recognize the benefits of healthy shoreland. Anyone living here knows that trees and plants create a beautiful natural environment that is home to all manner of birds, animals, and fish. For these property owners, screens of green trees and shrubs maintain privacy and reduce noise, adding to the peacefulness of a shoreland setting. Water shaded by leaves provides good habitat, and soil shielded by plants and bound by their interlocking roots is less susceptible to erosion. The vegetation also protects water quality by absorbing the nutrients that might otherwise grow scummy green algae. In short, the benefits of a healthy shoreland are everywhere. On the land, in the water, and even in the air. What is harder to recognize is how alterations we've made to shoreland in the past have worked against these natural systems and ultimately against us. Well, that is until they've combined to cause some serious and undesirable changes. Erosion, the loss of fish and wildlife, muddy, shallower water, greener lakes. The cumulative impact of years of development, removing vegetation, replacing it with lawns and impervious surfaces, such as pavement and roofs, is a growing problem. We're finding out that having done this, we've also cleared away many of the valuable benefits of living by the water, lot by lot. Thankfully, this isn't the end of the story. Given the chance, nature can recover, but it takes time. Depending on your site, allowing natural recovery by simply leaving areas unmowed is one way to start the pendulum back the other way. In a lot of cases, you'll need to jumpstart the process. Many local governments strongly support this cause. Across Wisconsin and the Midwest, shoreland ordinances have been strengthened to encourage or require landowners to maintain or restore native vegetation. And as more and more concerned citizens learn about these beneficial solutions, the number of people who are voluntarily putting them into practice is also growing. But there's more to accelerated restoration than simply planting trees. It takes planning, and it requires making some informed decisions. To these ends, it also calls for a basic understanding of the shoreland environment. A healthy buffer between the land and water is made up of three distinct types of vegetation. Trees, shrubs, and ground cover. Each type performs an important function in terms of binding soil and absorbing excess nutrients. And each is habitat for different species of wildlife. In this way, all three are tied together. In any shoreland restoration project, attention should be given to recreating this level of diversity. Before beginning any landscaping work in the shoreland area, it is a good idea to check with government agencies such as your county zoning department, county land conservation department, or DNR office to see if there are any standards, rules, or permits that will apply to your project or situation. In some cases, these agencies may also be a good source of information and assistance. It's always good to have a plan to guide the project. Depending upon the complexity of the project and local requirements, this can range from a simple sketch to a detailed landscaping plan that you do yourself or hire a landscaper to do for you. In any case, the plan should be designed around any restoration requirements and or your goals for the property. Is privacy important? Are there any views or structures that you want to hide? Are there any views, such as an opening toward the water, that you want to maintain? Where are the areas of existing native plants that you need to preserve? Where will walking paths be located? And how will you use your shoreline? For fishing, swimming, boating, or just as a quiet place to sit? The answers to these questions will help you decide where different types of vegetation should be located on the property. Choosing what to plant will also depend upon the type of soil, moisture, and amount of sunlight. 
Native plants are important because they have adapted to local conditions, and local wildlife have adapted to them. To determine which plants are native, the best indicator is to see what's growing on any nearby areas of undisturbed shoreline. It's also useful to observe how and where the plants are growing. Mimicking these natural systems as closely as possible is the goal. The easiest and surest option is to consult with local nurseries, government agencies, or university extension offices. These resources may have lists of plants that are native to the area. They can also help identify invasives, non-native plants that will compete with and may overrun desirable species. Sometimes ground cover that has been mowed or trimmed is native and can simply be allowed to regrow. In the case of lawns, however, in order to reduce competition and improve success for the new plants, it will be necessary to prepare the site for planting by getting rid of any pre-existing vegetation. The most common methods are smothering with plastic or applying herbicide. Smothering takes longer but requires no chemicals. After mowing the site, completely cover the area with plastic. Black plastic works best and should be 3.5 mils or thicker to stand up to the weather. Go around or cut holes for any existing plants you wish to preserve. If more than one sheet is required, overlap six inches along any boundaries. Anchor the plastic firmly in place using long staples and heavy objects. Leave the plastic in place for four to six weeks. Make sure there's no sign of living vegetation before uncovering the site. Herbicide is a much faster way to remove vegetation, but it must be used carefully and according to instructions. For example, some herbicides are only effective on actively growing plants, and the temperature must be 50 degrees Fahrenheit or higher. When applying an herbicide, shield and spray around native plants. Spray when there is no wind and rain is not forecast. Glyphosate-based herbicides are popular because they only affect plants that are sprayed directly. They also break down over several days into harmless natural substances. They must not, however, be used in the water or in places where the spray might drift into the water. After spraying, wait seven to ten days until all the vegetation is yellow. If there is still evidence of green vegetation, a second application may be necessary. Reapply as needed until all vegetation is dead before planting. Regardless of which method is used for killing existing vegetation, leave the dead plant material in place. It will serve as mulch for the new plants by holding moisture, anchoring soil, reducing weed growth, and contributing organic matter to the soil. Finding a source for native plants should not be too difficult. There are regional nurseries that specialize in these types. Local government agencies such as county zoning and county land conservation departments, as well as DNR and extension offices, can often point you in the right direction. Bear rootstock is an option when costs or labor are limiting factors. These are trees and shrubs that are still dormant, and thus the roots do not require water or soil prior to planting. Their rootstock is cheaper to buy and easier to plant than bald or containerized stock. The trade-offs are that bare rootstock is available only in the spring, before the trees and shrubs begin to sprout leaves, and the survival rate may be lower. Before planting bare rootstock, trim any trailing or dangling roots that might ball up and inhibit root growth and anchoring. Similarly, dig holes deep enough so that the roots won't curl or bunch. Trees and shrubs should be planted to the depth of the old soil line. The old soil line is marked by paler colored bark and a slight swelling on the stem. Pack soil around the roots. Any air pockets will dry out the roots. Pack firmly but gently, taking care not to stomp on roots. Containerized trees and shrubs are more costly, but because they come potted in nutrient-rich soil, they can be planted any time during the growing season, and their survival rate is higher. Large bald and burlap trees are the most expensive to buy and are hard work to plant, 
but the results are instantaneous. Before planting containerized seedlings or shrubs, lay down two to three inches of mulch. Mulch around any desirable or previously planted trees or shrubs. Mulch should be in the form of straw, wood chips, leaves, or shredded bark. Don't use hay because it typically contains lots of weed seeds. Avoid planting during the heat of the day. Plants have a much better chance of survival if they are planted on a cool day or in the morning. Holes should be dug so that the plants can be buried flush to the level of the soil line. When spacing trees and shrubs, pay attention to any instructions that came with the plants. Your site plan will also play a role in spacing. Generally, vegetation that is spaced farther apart will grow up bushier, well suited for screening. Seedlings spaced closer together will grow taller and be less bushy. An important thing to keep in mind is that in nature, trees and shrubs do not grow in regular lines or patterns. Clumping vegetation will eventually result in a more natural look and will create better habitat for wildlife. It is also important to remember that you don't need bare ground to create a view. Often, plants that are three or four feet high will still provide a fine view of the water. Holes for planting smaller ground cover type plants are most easily dug using an auger, trowel, or bulb planter. Make sure, however, that you penetrate through the mulch and into soil. If the plants are root bound, gently freeing them with a knife before planting will help them root and grow properly. After planting, make sure the plant is not buried in mulch. Watering plants, shrubs, and trees is critical. Watering immediately after planting and then regularly in the following days and weeks is perhaps the most important step for ensuring their success. Unless it rains, plants should be watered at least every morning for two to three weeks after planting. If the weather is excessively hot, watering again in the afternoon may be necessary. Once the plants become established, watering is required only if prolonged dry periods occur during the first year. Something to keep in mind is that new plants are vulnerable to browsing animals and other pests. Taking any necessary steps to shield plants from these critters will help improve their survivability and protect your investment. One of the big benefits of a shoreland restoration project is that it requires no mowing or fertilizers. In fact, unless any invasives crop up and need to be weeded out, landscaping comprised of native plants and trees typically requires no maintenance whatsoever. The bottom line is this, restoring your shoreland does take time, but the results and the benefits will grow more and more apparent with each passing year. Effortless to maintain, beautiful and teeming with life, natural shoreland is a lush and desirable alternative to its cleared or manicured counterpart. And unlike developed property, natural shoreland promotes and sustains a healthy ecosystem something that will help protect water quality and property values over the long run. Mistakes made in the past may have left us with some growing problems, but thanks to shoreland restoration techniques, we have a growing solution.